Alright guys, Fiddleferret here, and welcome back to another episode of Sweetest Monster. So, we're about to go into Melody's room. I don't think we've actually seen her or met her yet um, in the story so far, so this should be interesting. And with this small apology, I take my hand off the of the brass knocker and turn it. Melly's door opens slowly, creaking with each and every inch. I think the hinges might be starting to go. I step inside Melody's private quarters, her inner sanctum, and shut the door behind me. I used to go into Melly's room all the time when she was younger to read picture books and to, uh, read picture books to her about mm, I never even heard of these, probably English ones. And the Cooney, Cooney and the Cat, never heard of him, to help her not off to sleep. But that was a long, long time ago. When was the last time I came in here? Maybe it was a few months ago. Maybe it was more. I don't remember. Melly's room is dark. The lights are off and the curtains are drawn. But I can dimly make out shapes in the gloom. She doesn't... We're not gonna come in here and find her like hanging from the ceiling, are we? Because I'm not I'm not really prepared for that sad of a story at the moment. I just came in here to chill and record some visual novel. Don't you be pulling no suicide on me, because I that's starting to be what this feels like. Melly's bookcase is stacked full of paperbacks with thumbed well thumbed through Philip Plumens and Jake Rowlings. And I can see familiar figures scattered across her desk. The droopy, cotton ears of her plush Betsy Bear lolling next to her beaten up old Cooney cat who's missing one of her paws. Standing in this room almost feels like entering a time capsule, sealed off from the rest of time and space. I could be nine, ten years younger, and Melly could be my cute little girl again, still shy, but not nearly as awkward. Maybe Melly loved me more back then. I think I might have loved her more back then too. I can see a small lump curled up underneath her covers, covers and long black hair fanning out across the blue spread pen. Bed, beds, wow, bedspread. Now deep navy in the darkness. Melly's back is turned towards me, so I can, so I can't see her face. I'm not sure if I'm happy about this or not. I wonder what kind of expression she's making. Do I really want to know? Melly. I approach her slowly, cautiously, as a convict might approach the gallows, as Marie Antonine herself must have done before, before 200 years ago. Melly, are you asleep? A stupid question to ask, of course. If she really is asleep, she can't possibly answer. And if she isn't, then she must be pretending. So she won't reply to me anyway. As expected, she doesn't say anything. The silence stretches on. Look, I... I'm sorry for intruding, Melly. I won't stay long. I think about taking a seat on her bed by Melly's side, but I don't. After such a long time of silence between the pair of us, I don't think we're ready for such a big commitment. Man, you are her dad, right? Like, Jesus! I mean, I want to feel bad for you sometimes, but golly! Even so, I feel restless. I fish Betsy Bear up from Melly's desk for some reason. Cooney Cat looks a little too intimidating for my liking, with her matted fur and missing paw and turn her over in my hands, just to give myself something to do. I... I just thought I should come up here because I wanted to say I'm sorry. Melly doesn't stir. I didn't expect her to either, so that's just fine. I'm not sorry that you hurt your leg, mind, because I know that was just an unfortunate accident, and nobody's to blame for that, least of all you, Melly. I know it wasn't your fault. That isn't, to, that isn't to say I'm not worried about you, because I am. But I know you're a tough girl, and you'll get well soon. 
Sally said it was only a sprain. You didn't even break a bone. Isn't that good? More silence. I know I'm rambling. It's a bad habit of mine, but I can't stop myself. The silence is pervasive, per pervasive creeping into the very interior of my skull like a thick smog. And I need to try and blot it out. Maybe if I can fill the room with the sound of my inane, inarticulate chatter, I can kid myself into thinking I'm having some kind of meanif meaningful conversation with Melly. That this, whatever this is, might actually change something. I just... I'm sorry if I haven't been talking to you enough lately, Melly. I know I've been kind of distant, and it isn't your fault. I swear it isn't, I just... I've been really busy with at work, and I know you're probably thinking, how could he be busy? He's just a music teacher, and I'm not bad about it. Everybody thinks it. Even Sally thinks it. The truth of the matter is, our school didn't do so well in the last Ofsted report, and a lot of parents have been complaining, and it it's kind of stressful. Not that I want to burden you with my own worries, of course, but I just wanted to let you know. That's why I haven't been around so much. It's not because of you. It's not because I'm trying to avoid you. The thought never crossed my mind. Well, I suppose it crossed my mind just now, but it only crossed my mind in order to tell you that it didn't. I exhale heavily, squeezing the poor, abused Betsy Bear to my chest. I wish I didn't have to feel anxious. What kind of grown man is scared of his own daughter? But I can't help it. I'm... Sorry if I've been acting short with you lately too, Melly. That isn't your fault. It's mine. I'm just stressed, I suppose, and I... I'm sorry that we didn't go out last weekend. I know I promised, but I just got caught up with something. I know it doesn't make much... I know it doesn't make it better, but I really... Really am sorry. At this, Melly makes a noise. It's so small it could belong to a mouse, but I heard it clearly nonetheless. So Melly wasn't asleep after all. She really is listening to me. That, at least, is a little reassuring. If you want, we can go out this weekend, do something together, like a family. How about that? Melly doesn't say anything in response, but I see her shift slightly underneath her duvet. Does that mean she's thinking about it? Yeah, it'll be fun. We haven't done anything together for a while, so it might be nice to get out of the house. We can go anywhere you want. To the zoo, for a walk, maybe to the beach. I know how much you like to go to Whitby when you were little. Anyway, you don't need to come to a decision right now. Just think about it. If you want to go anywhere, just tell me your Sal. We'll sort it out for you. Melly doesn't, still doesn't respond, but I think I've got her attention. I wonder if it's some kind of cruel genetic trick that when I get anxious, I can talk forever, whereas when Nelly gets anxious, she can hardly force out a single syllable. We might be father and daughter, but I don't think we have much in common. We're more like polar opposites, really. But even so, we are flesh and blood. We are related. I promise, Melly. You want to go out? We'll go out. You deserve it. You're my daughter, and I love you very much. I love her more than the words themselves can express. I think about giving Melly's, Melly's head a pat, her hair a stroke, but I don't. Instead, I squeeze Betsy Bear tighter until her head collapses in and on itself like a rotting fruit. Oh, okay. I mean, I would have pat my own daughter on the head because that would have showed her that I cared and I'm actually there for her, but whatever. <laughs> I still can't decide if I like this guy at all, really. Like, I find it hard to feel bad for him. At times. I spend much of the next day in a sense of hyper-alertness. My eyes peeled for even the slightest glimpse of... Glimpse of a pair of bright green eyes or black tail. However, the hours tick by slowly in a cacophony of screaming children and their warbling, discordant singing voices, and I still see no sign of her. I'm not sure if I should be relieved by Belle's conspicuous absence or not. On one hand, I did enjoy the intention, but on the other, I would rather not jeopardize my relationship with Sally any further. She is my wife, after all, and I do love her. 
you have a funny way of showing it. <laughs> That's what I keep telling myself. I'm sure you do. Finally finished with my school for the day, and not a minute too soon, I wipe my brow and heave a heavy sigh. Kids, they really take it out of you. Sally wanted us to have more children, a son perhaps, for Melly to play with, but I thought that sounded like too much of a hassle, especially since I work with children every day. People might romantically think of children as perfect angels. Still images from blurry Victorian photographs with big eyes and curly hairs and super smiles. I, however, know otherwise. Young children are manics. Only this morning, I had to scold Peter Newberry for hitting poor Gemma Ashton over the head with a recorder. And that's not to mention the fun, particularly ingenious brass in yeah, and these brass players could have with their spit valves. I really don't get paid enough for this. With a groan, I shrug my coat. I shrug my coat onto my shoulders and do a quick circuit around the music room. I close and lock the windows, draw the curtains, and turn off the lights. And then, satisfied that everything is in order, I exit and lock the classroom. It is as I'm making my way through the car park, reaching into my trouser pocket for my car keys, that, I, that I'm suddenly stopped short by a distinctive, by a distinctively feminine voice. Belle. Hey, if it isn't my favorite human. She's leaning against my car, waving. She's wearing that school uniform again, the one she donned during her surprise visit to me yesterday lunchtime. Her dark hair flutters in the breeze, while her white limbs stand out alarmingly against my car. Ah, hey, yourself, what are you doing? Isn't it obvious? I'm waiting for you. Don't you think it might look a tad suspicious, a schoolgirl from St. Catherine's loitering around my car like this? Oh yeah, I did get a few funny glances. You did, did you? Yep, there was this woman who had a face like a trout. Her skin was gray, and her eyes were squinty and all close together, like this. Belle pulls a face, pursing her lips and making her eyes bug out until she looks like she's wearing a Halloween mask. I laugh despite myself. If there's one thing I like, it's a girl who knows how to poke fun at herself, and she gets bonus points for being pretty. And she gets bonus points for being so pretty to begin with. I take it you had a run-in with the eminent and esteemed headmistress, head then. Oh, and I take it from your tone, you don't like her very much. Not particularly, no. I don't think she likes me very much either, so... I walk over to my car and unlock it, the keys jingling in my hand. Did she say anything to you? Hmm, she was like... What are you doing hanging around here? Do you have business with our school? And what did you say? I almost dread to think. Mm, well, I believe honesty is the best policy, so I told her the truth. What a pure girl you are. Indeed, I said. Indeed, I said? Yes, I do have business with your school. I'm waiting for Mr. Hawkins, the music teacher. You see, I'm his teenage sex slave, and we're doing, and we're going to do a, all kinds of exciting things together. <laughs> I snap my head upwards, moving so fast to crick my neck. I really hope, for both our sakes, you had enough sense not to say that. It, it isn't true, anyway, and why the tee hee? No, I didn't say that, obviously. I was just checking to see if you were paying attention. I was paying attention. I was just putting some stuff in the boot. That, that's the trunk, if you're a British person. <laughs> or European. I wonder, it's so weird how we all have different, uh, whatchamacallits, words for things. <laughs> whatchamacallits, you know, words, those things. God, I'm illiterate, I swear sometimes. Yeah, but I don't like it. I'm here now, so why should, why you should pay attention to me? It's rude to talk to a lady and not even look her in the face, you know. 
I know, I'm sorry, Sally says the same thing. I deposit a box I deposit a box full of music sheet in the back of the car and straighten up, closing the boot with a dull thud. So, what did you really say? I'm all ears. I said I was one of your piano students and I had a lesson with you after school. Is that an acceptable ruse? I suppose it's, it's acceptable. It might seem a little suspicious though. Why? Because I'm so adorable? The real answer is because I'm starting to develop a guilty conscience, but I don't say that. Instead, I shake my head. Why should I feel guilty? I don't... I haven't done anything. It isn't a crime to talk to a young girl. Sorry, immortality spirit, is it? Besides, all the kisses we've exchanged have been one way. Belle was the one kissing me, not the other way around. Oh man, he's... Super Rationalization Man! I tried to change the subject. It's easier than confronting the real issue at hand. That I may inadvertently be cheating on my wife. Your skirt is still far too short. Miss Fishlip said the exact same thing. It's nice to know you can afford you can afford other authority figures the same level of respect you give me. Psh. Belle gives a snort and rolls her eyes. They seem even greener than usual. As if I have to answer to that crusty old dragon lady, I'm probably old enough to be her great-great-grandmother. Of course. I can't imagine and Mayor uh, Maria Antonine answer, answered to anybody, save the guillotine, of course. Oh, so you remembered. How could I help but remember? It isn't every day you meet a girl who claims to be a reincarnation of a famous historical figure. A famous historical figure who got her head lopped off, nonetheless. Oh, excuse me. So, now that we've established that you're waiting for me, I want to know the reason why. What are you planning? Planning? Why, Mr. Hawkins, you wound me. You make it sound as though there's something sinister afoot. I think there might be, given you're involved. I still don't even know what you are. Not really. How cruel. I didn't I didn't come here to haunt you if that's what you're implying. I came here because I missed you. You did. That's right. <laughs> oh god, my voice. It feels like it's been so long. I saw you yesterday, Belle. That's right, yesterday. That was a whole 24 hours ago. I was so bored and lonely, I thought I was going to die. It's rabbits that die of loneliness, not cats. Same difference. They're really not the same. Whatever. What are you... Weren't you thinking about me as well? I turned my head to one side, trying to avoid Belle's gaze. It's true, I was thinking about Belle. How could I not? Who wouldn't think about her? Especially given how she insists on wearing such ridiculous and practical outfits. But I can't tell her that. I don't want to give her the satisfaction. Honestly, no. I had a very busy day, which doesn't leave much time for mooning over schoolgirls. <laughs> Liar. I I'm not. Yes, you are. I can see it in your eyes. Damn, I must be more transparent than I thought. Anyway, since I went to the trouble of coming to see you, shall we get going? Uh, where? On a date, of course. He's not actually going, is he? Of course. She says it like it's the most natural thing in the world. Maybe to a finicky feline who comes and goes as she pleases it is. But it's not to me. I'm a middle-aged man, and I have other commitments. I have a wife to return home to, and a daughter I need to talk to. I promised her last night. I said we could go somewhere together tomorrow. If these plans have any hope of emerging into fruition, I should return home. Now. I need to discuss things with Sally. I can't keep running away. Even if I have a very arresting distraction tugging at my arm, peering up at me with big green eyes. Come on, Robin! I missed you! I miss doing this! Hangering, hangering old men? 
No, I mean, going out, having fun. I spent so long living as a cat, I completely forgot what it was like to go and be with real people. I need some adult company or I'll go mad. I'm sick of being picked up and petted and stroked and patted on the head and called a good boy or a good girl. The two are interchangeable since who knows what gender cats really are and who really cares. Now that I have a human body, I want to take advantage of it. I want to have some fun. Can't you do that on your own? I could, but that would be boring. Isn't it far more enjoyable to spend time with a person you like? I wince, my resolve wavering. Why am I so weak-willed? Melly can languish away in her room like a tower princess for months, and I'll be happy to ignore it. But this one girl, who's still a... A vir virile stra uh, virtual stranger starts tugging at my arm and pulling the theatrics and I'm already lost. I wonder what that says about where my loyalties lie. I think it says, though I'm no professional psychologist, not like Joan Fowler, that I'm an asshole. Is that the correct medical term? I mean, I've, I'd have to agree at this point. I don't know why you'd be like, Belle, I'll see, I'll see you like later. I mean, if you want to see her again, just be like, I can't today, I have to go home. But, but, it'll look suspicious. An old man like me, hanging around with such a young girl? It's fine. I'll just say I'm your trophy wife. T trophy wife? Where do spirits pick up such phrases? Eh, well, maybe not. That might be a bit too much. I can just pretend that I'm your daughter or something. It'll be fine. I swallow. All of a sudden, my, my throat feels dry. That's a very kind offer, but I already have a daughter. I know you do, but it's not like you spend time... You spend any time with her, is it? Well, Belle's grip around my arm tightens. Though her body is slender and willowy, she's unnaturally strong. I feel like my side is being squeezed by a vice, stopped up the blood circulation through my right arm. You can think of it as a test run for the real thing. Just imagine that I'm Melly and we're going out to have a gay old time. Nobody says that anymore. It has other implications. Now, now, let's not split hairs. Let's just go enjoy ourselves. I can't deny that Bell's offer sounds tempting. Not as a test run for spending time with my real daughter, but because Belle is an amusing person, and I enjoy her company. I've probably had more fun with her in these last three days than I have in the last three months combined. That's wrong though, isn't it? Belle isn't my daughter, Melly is, and I did promise. Dude, I, I, I can't feel bad for this guy anymore! Like... Oh, there's there's really no redeeming thing about this. It's like you have a daughter that desperately needs you and is probably depressed and hurting inside. And you're just like, ah, fuck it. I said I'd try to spend more time with her. I wish I didn't feel so conflicted. I wish I wasn't so weak-willed. Me too, asshole. I already know what I'm going to say before the words come out of my mouth. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. All right, I'm ending this episode here. Um, yes, <laughs> we'll be back soon. Uh, but until then, thanks for watching, guys. I've been Fiddle Ferret, and I'll see you back on the prowl next time.